You can support In the Past Lane by buying some of our merchandise, like shirts, hoodies, mugs, and stickers. Just go to our website, inthepastlane.com. Thanks. On May 17, 1924, hundreds of Notre Dame University students gathered at the train station in South Bend, Indiana. They were there to greet a train, but the mood was anything but festive. That's because this train was filled with members of the Ku Klux Klan, who were heading for a mass Klan rally in South Bend. The KKK's decision to hold the gathering in South Bend was no accident, because Indiana's Klansmen looked upon Notre Dame as a symbol of rising Catholic power in America. This Klan event was intended to intimidate the university, its faculty and students, to send a message that they were unwelcome in the American heartland. Alas, the only message delivered that morning came from Notre Dame students, who pummeled the Klansmen and shredded their robes as they disembarked the train. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hello, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about American history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 74, in which we look at the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. We are coming to you this week from the Hiram Johnson Studios, located in central Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. At the control board, as always, is our splendid executive producer, Lulu Spencer. So what's happening in In the Past Lane this week? Well, it's early June, and I'm still digging out from a super busy semester. My office at the college is littered with folders and papers and all sorts of things. But I should have all that in order by Friday, whereupon I'll be in full-on summer mode. That's when I finally get to attend to a million things that I had to set aside during the academic year. A lot of them having to do with the podcast. Things like updating the website, developing new promotional materials, and booking and recording new interviews. And there's always a long list of technical things to address. For example, in order for people to say to their new smart speaker, Hey Alexa, play the In the Past Lane podcast, I need to create something called a skill. I'm not sure what this is, but I think I have a piece of paper around here someplace that will tell me what to do. I also have a home recording studio that I've been working on, and now is the perfect time to finally get this thing up and running. So yeah, lots to do, but all good. In other news, thanks so much to everyone who pledged to support the In the Past Lane podcast, either through Patreon or PayPal. New supporters include Maeve, Jonah, Billy, and Gideon. Your support helps cover the costs that go into the making of this podcast, things like recording equipment and monthly fees for the podcast and website hosting. So thanks. And remember, everyone, you can support the podcast for as little as $1 a month. Just go to inthepastlane.com and click on support. Thanks. Okay, we need to get to the main feature of this episode, my interview with historian Linda Gordon about her new book, The Second Coming of the KKK, The Ku Klux Klan of the 1920s and the American Political Tradition. All that's left for me to say is, please subscribe to the podcast at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. And tell your friends about In the Past Lane, and maybe even give us a shout out on social media. Personal recommendations are one of the most common ways that people discover new podcasts. Thanks. Okay, people. Better pack a fire extinguisher. There may be burning crosses in this episode. Your journey in the past lane begins now. In August 2017, many Americans were shocked to see white supremacists marching through the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia, wearing the regalia and carrying symbols of Nazis and the Ku Klux Klan. The news coverage of these open displays of racist hate revealed to many Americans a startling fact. 
that the KKK was not a relic of the past. A vibrant remnant of the organization was alive and well in 21st century America. And it was augmented by a wide range of other organizations dedicated to white supremacy. Anyone who read a little deeper into the history of the KKK at this point learned that there were four versions of this organization that arose over the years. The original is the one that most people think of, the KKK that formed in 1866 to wage a campaign of white supremacist terror against recently emancipated African Americans. That campaign succeeded in using terrorist violence to strip African Americans of nearly all their civil, legal, political, and economic rights. It faded away in the 1890s, its job largely done. But in 1915, a second version of the KKK was born. Only this time, as we're about to learn, it was no longer confined to the American South, and it no longer confined its program of hate to black Americans. By the mid-1920s, this second coming of the KKK had a national membership of between 4 and 5 million, and it exerted enormous political influence. To tell us all about this long ago but now intensely relevant chapter in American history, I have on the line historian Linda Gordon. She is a professor of history at New York University and the author of many books, including The Great Arizona Orphan Abduction and the biography Dorothea Lang, A Life Beyond Limits, both winners of the prestigious Bancroft Prize. Her most recent book is The Second Coming of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan of the 1920s and the American political tradition. And so it is with great pleasure that I say, Linda Gordon, welcome to In the Past Lane. Thank you for having me. Reading your book, one really can't help but notice the disturbing fact that there are so many parallels between the 1920s and our current moment. And in recent, just to cite a couple of examples, I mean, in recent years, we've seen the, the rise of angry white nationalism, conspiracy theories, fake news, skepticism about science, rage against immigrants, and a lot of openly expressed racism against African Americans and Jews, among others. So these are the same things that mark the rise of the KKK in the 1920s, which you write about in your book. So with that in mind, uh, before we get there, why don't we, since your book is about the second coming of the KKK, why don't you give us an example of what the original KKK was and how it differs from this second one? Sure. The first Ku Klux Klan was established in the southern states immediately after the Civil War. It had one and one clear focus, and that was to maintain white supremacy and to intimidate any movement among African Americans to try to claim equal rights. It was a terrorist organization in the literal meaning of that term. And what I mean by that is that in the over 4,000 lynchings that were done in the South, the purpose was not mainly or not even primarily to punish individuals, but to strike fear into the hearts of all African Americans. That's what terrorism is when you use an attack on one person or a group to influence all the others. That clan was primarily limited to the southern states. It, however, did give birth to a larger sense that white supremacy was actually threatened. This is very odd, but it is similar to what you will see in the Second Klan, and that is that anybody looking at the history would say that there was no significant threat of any kind to white supremacy in the South for decades after the Civil War. But the Klan operated by being able to rev up fear, and one of the things it used in a particularly ugly way was the idea that these African-American men were just constantly itching to rape white women, for which there was no evidence whatsoever. But if you don't mind, I can just make a transition into the second clan. Sure. In 1915, a movie called Birth of a Nation appeared. It's probably well known to many of the listeners here. That's right. America's first blockbuster, essentially. Yes, it was a black blockbuster, and the key part of Birth of a Nation was this notion that you have these marauding, savage African Americans chasing after white women. It certainly brought that notion further north than it had ever been previously. And also the heroes of the film are... Not to spoil the ending for anybody, but uh, the, the heroes at the end are the KKK, who ride into town and restore white supremacy and order. 
Exactly. So this is a key moment in 1915 that sort of marks, if we had to pick a beginning point for the revival of the KKK, that certainly seems to be an important marker because it does inspire a revival of interest in the organization. And there's other things happening as well. There's mass immigration that's roaring along. And then in 1920, another kind of marker is the publication of the Protocols of Zion, which is a an original version or an earlier version of fake news. It's a publication published by none other than, than Henry Ford, and it alleges an international Jewish conspiracy. It's alleging that it's this old document that has the minutes of a meeting that took place in the late 19th century that uh, by Jewish conspirators to take over the global order. And this becomes, a, if not a bestseller, a best reader because Ford distributes a half a million copies and it gets picked up by many others. Does that play a key role in this kind of revival? Yes, a very key role, although there's some a bit of a just coincidence. The coincidence with Henry Ford's virulent anti-Semitism and promotion of this absurd forgery, but the connection to the second clan was less direct. In my book, at least, I argue, the evidence seems to suggest that the second clan understood that if they continued to focus exclusively on African Americans, they were not going to get much traction in the North because in the 1920s, there still were very few African Americans in the North. And so they expanded their enemies list to include Jews and Catholics. And recently arrived immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. Yes. And, but of course, most of those recently arrived immigrants were not Protestant. And so there's a complete overlap between this anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish sentiment and the anti-immigration. Right. So they're going to tap into that broad national sentiment. And it's partly it's a it's a traditional kind of nativism that is worried about the cultural differences that these people bring and seeing them as threats to America. But it also revives another aspect of nativism that we often overlook, which is conspiracy theory, that this isn't just a problem of flooding the country with lower order people with lower intelligence and bad habits and backward ways, but these people are actually part of a larger global conspiracy, whether it's the plot of the Pope to take over America by sending millions of Catholics or some sort of larger or similar international conspiracy about Jews. How does that play into the, this notion? What is it about this conspiracy theory that seems to be such an essential part of the rise of the Klan? I would say two things about this, and I I do want to say that when I first started doing this research, it was very, very hard for me to understand how any significant number of people could have believed some of the absolutely inane, outrageous claims that the Second Clan was making. I began to understand maybe a little bit why that worked, and I think it has a lot to do with where people heard these conspiracy theories from. And I think we see that a lot today, too. I think people Mm -hmm. tend to believe what they're told from people who they respect as an authority. One of the key strengths of the second clan were the number of evangelical Protestant ministers who were enthusiastic members. The clan claimed that there were 40,000 ministers in their organization. I, I don't see any reason to believe that literally because the Klan was constantly exaggerating. But nevertheless, we know that thousands of ministers were preaching respect for the Klan, even urging people to join the Klan in their sermons. But the Klan also used in promoting these conspiracy theories a real, a huge reservoir of traveling lecturers, many of whom were themselves ministers. It's important that they were ministers because ministers, especially evangelical ones, are often people who are experienced speakers, who know how to rev up an audience. So that was going on. But beneath that, I think, uh, maybe not all, but an awful lot of conspiracy theories seem to people believable because they have been made fearful. Mm Mm-hmm. The notion that the Pope was this huge international power that could do all these extraordinary things was a kind of, it was, in a way, it's a kind of a feat because, after all, the Ku Klux Klan, the second Ku Klux Klan, represented its constituency was the people who were the majority of Americans, that is, white Protestants. And yet they managed to convince people that 
these white people were being victimized by so many of these groups of people who were actually much less powerful, much less influential. Yeah, conspiracy theories don't need to be based in fact. They just need to be convincing and also presented by convincing sources, whether it's a minister or a very effective demagogic uh, lecturer uh, or some of the many, I mean, you note that the Klan is pretty extraordinary as far as embracing modern methods of movement creation. They have at one point 150 newspapers and two radio stations. So they're pretty expert at getting a, getting the message out. And that accounts for the fact that one of the things that I think you set out to do, which is to sort of shatter the myth that this clan, even though it has the same name, is based in the South and it's based in uneducated rural people flocking to it, that this is a national movement that's incredibly strong across the Midwest and in the West. There are you know, lots of great anecdotes, one of which is that you know Anaheim, California was at one point had such a strong clan membership, it was known as Clanaheim. And uh, places like Madison, Wisconsin had very strong Klan presence. So that's a pretty different version of a Klan that we're sort of used to, at least in popular culture. Exactly, exactly. It is, however, important to emphasize here that this northern Klan was primarily nonviolent. Not exclusively, but primarily. In fact, their major strategy was an electoral strategy. Right. They ran really literally hundreds of candidates. They elected 11 governors, 45 members of Congress, and this is just people who openly ran as clansfolk. Right, almost like the way that people claim membership in key organizations today. It was a, it was a badge of honor. Right, exactly. Not only a badge of honor, but in many cases, actually, it was a prestigious organization in mm -hmm. many locations. So that people joined because they wanted to be able to hobnob with important people in their communities. Furthermore, you know, it, it, you mentioned it just a minute ago, this myth that the Klan was an organization of sort of uneducated rural clodhoppers. A lot of people believe that until another historian way back in the 1960s did some actual counting and found out that the Klan was most powerful in cities, yeah. which I think many people find really shocking. Right. Furthermore, some of the studies show that the Klan's people were no less educated than the population at large, no poorer than the population at large. They had a healthy component of professional people, businessmen, etc., so we really have to give up some of those myths about about the Klan. Yeah, and part of this successful political move was that they presented themselves as, you know, very openly, but also more particularly as patriotic fraternal orders. They're really not a hate organization. They're not even necessarily openly embracing the political side of things. Just simply saying, no, 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 we're just a fraternal organization. And to emphasize that, they held county fairs and they sponsored baseball teams and had, you know, would sponsor beauty contests where women would compete for the quote, Miss 100% America prize. And they sponsored college fraternities. So they seem to be very good at creating this idea that they were nothing more, nothing less than a, you know, something like the, the Elks Lodge or the, you know, the Masons, that they were just a, in that long line of American fraternal orders. And this had a really powerful way of kind of masking what they really stood for. I think so. And furthermore, the Klan liked to point out that it was not the only so-called fraternal order that discriminated and only allowed people of a certain ethnicity and a certain race to join. Fraternals in the United States, which were very popular at that time, generally were divided by ethnicity. There were Jewish fraternal orders and German ones and Italian ones, etc. So the idea of that kind of I don't know if I want to call it segregation, but of, you know, uh, hobnobbing only with one's own was not in any way foreign to to many Americans. Right. And it seems that helps explain some of the optics that the Klan carries out, in which you have many really extraordinary photographs in your book. And I think the one that strikes most people is the one of the great parade down the Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., with thousands of Klansmen in their full regalia but of course also carrying American flags. And it's, you know, this sort of, if you wanted one image to give a sense of their legitimacy in the public eye, but also they're wrapping themselves in, in patriotism, 
that would certainly seem to be the one. Yes, and since you mentioned that big march in Washington, D.C., one of the interesting things that comes as a surprise to a lot of people is the very, very large participation of women. And this is another difference from the first clan. Mm -hmm. The first clan was a male-only organization. The second clan, women joined very, very enthusiastically. The women's KKK, as it was called, was never as large as the men's, but it had something like one and a half million members. I think this is a really important thing to keep in mind because while they did not participate in the kind of vigilantism that the second clan did, there's certainly no sign that they objected to it in any way. And they were often not necessarily joining because their husbands were members, but it turns out in many cases, women joined first and sort of drew their husbands in. Was that due to uh, perhaps the greater participation of women in church-related activities? I think that's right, because there was a huge overlap, not only with the churches, but also with the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Right. And here's another force that contributed to the growth of the Klan. Women got the vote in 1920, and women in the United States, particularly Protestant women, were overwhelmingly supporters of prohibition. And the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which was a massive organization, was also primarily an of not only a Protestant, but in many ways an anti-Catholic organization because they developed the idea that drinking alcohol was a kind of Catholic sin. Very, very much not the case, but the notion was that Protestants just didn't do that. Right, and it was sort of associated with a a package of ideas that people who drank also lived in cities, also were, you know, if not immigrants, they were closer to some sort of immigrant ethnic heritage. Right. Yeah, so prohibition coming along does play a key role because something I'd learned about a year ago or so talking to Lisa McGurr about her book on prohibition was that the KKK became a very important unofficial enforcement arm of the law establishment. The KKK, you know, attacked people that illegally brewed alcohol and their distilleries and so forth. And this was something I didn't, I knew that they were, they envisioned alcohol as the, you know, a a marker of urban elites and urban immigrants, but not that they had been so closely allied with in prohibition enforcement itself. Yes. A lot of what the clan, the second clan of its vigilantism was directed against bootleggers or saloons and so on. And it is quite possible that women really egged them on. Mm-hmm. It's also true, however, that the support for prohibition was something that ultimately really undermined the clan because there were just case after case after case of its clan members who were caught drinking. Right. <laughs> you know, there's always a huge hypocrisy about prohibition, I think, among a lot of Americans. And one of the other aspects that you brought out about this second version of the KKK is that it is all these things you mentioned. It's a fraternal society, at least the way it positions itself. Um, it's a patriotic society. Um, It's deeply tied to evangelicalism and prohibition, but it's also a financial organization. And this is a a really interesting part that this is a multi-million dollar operation that takes in as much as $25 million a year in dues and membership fees and merchandise sales. $25 million in the 1920s is, you know, well over $300 million in our current money. So tell us more about this aspect that this is a, in some ways, a pyramid scheme or a multi-level marketing scheme that eventually comes back to kind of bring the whole organization down. Yes, the second clan was actually incorporated as a for-profit business. And in a certain legalistic way, when the first imperial wizard gave way to the second imperial wizard, the title of the heads of the clan, the second guy, Hiram Evans, had to buy the clan from William Simmons, the first person. Now, I suspect yeah. that, that there's no documentation about this. I suspect this may have been a sort of symbolic purchase for a dollar or something like that. But to look at that kind of financing is actually a clue to understanding another very important thing about clan ideology. And that is, they were people who believed that the profit motive had, is what has made America great. This is one of the reasons Mm -hmm. I'm very uncomfortable with calling the Klan a populist organization, because it never even pretended to support anything that would have benefited 
working class and lower middle class people. And in fact, they had nothing but enormous respect for corporations, corporate CEOs, even Wall Street. And that ideology is partly, I think, why its members seem to accept without question the system of recruitment by commission. The system was that if you recruited someone else to the clan, you got to keep 40% of their initiation fee, which was $10, worth well over $100 today. This is not cheap to join the clan. But then the person who was then initiated can turn around and go uh, recruit someone else and keep 40%. Right. So you go and go and go down until like in a classic pyramid scheme, you're getting to a point where the more recent members don't have anybody left that they can recruit. They've sort of used up support for the clan in their community. So there was a lot of resentment about that, but there was also increasing rumors and evidence that the big shots in the clan were using these enormous amounts of monies that were coming in for their personal benefit. And that also added to ultimately the decline of the clan. In fact, I think it seems to be the case that all throughout the rise of, say, from 1920 to 1926 or 27, that was the period in which the clan was strong. But I think there's a lot of evidence that suggests that during that time, there was a lot of turnover in members. Mm. And so the very large figure of people who say there were 5 million members of the clan do not mean that there were 5 million at any one time, because the few examples of minutes of clan meetings that we have show that there were constantly nagging their members to pay dues and criticizing members who did not pay right. dues. So that was another part of what led this to be a very short-lived organization. Right, but they did have some notable successes, some lasting impacts, and uh, the one that you point to is the 1924 National Origins Act, also known as the Johnson-Reed Act. And Mr. Johnson, Albert Johnson, uh, was a member of the KKK. So tell us more about that law that radically changed our immigration policy and lasted for many decades. Yes, it lasted from 1924 to 1965, 40-some years. Essentially, the victory of that bill points to something else that's very important to understand about the Klan, and that is beyond people who are actually members were millions who basically supported the Klan's race, ethnic, religious bigotry. Mm -hmm. The 1924 Immigration Reform Act, which, you know, we had some immigration, some quite discriminatory immigration controls on the West Coast directed against Japanese Americans, Chinese, etc. But this was the first general law, the first across-the-board limitation of immigration into the United States. And what that act did is it installed into law exactly the Klan's racial, ethnic, religious hierarchy. It was a system in which the people that the Klan would have called Nordic, meaning Scandinavians, British, German, Protestants, would be given high quotas. And at the very bottom, people that we might think of the Italians, the Jews, the Greeks, they had very, very tiny immigration quotas. Yeah, sometimes as low as a thousand, even though they were sending 50,000 yes. a year yeah. up to the law. And it's very explicit when you read the details of it. It's talking about preserving America's racial composition and so forth. And there's a lot of racial formulas that they try to come up with to sort of carry that out. And that's not surprising that it's the 1960s in the era of civil rights and concerns about racism and so forth, that that law is repealed and a new law is passed and signed by President Lyndon Johnson. Well, you can see this rather meteoric rise of the, of the Klan in the 1920s. And then it, it also sort of collapses rather quickly, at least in terms of an organization. And you mentioned one thing, which was that there's kind of high living and there are accusations of corruption against the leadership. There's also a huge scandal involving the Grand Wizard, David Stevenson. And maybe you could tell us about that and how all this ultimately leads to the KKK, at least as a formal organization, collapsing. All through the Klan's career, there were cases of Klansmen committing crimes, being caught drinking, etc. There was not one single case, however, in which a Klan's person was convicted of a crime until the case of David Stevenson, who was the Grand Goblin, as he called himself, of 
Indiana, of the Indiana clan. This is a case that is really quite bizarre as well as sadistic because Stevenson was actually convicted of kidnapping, raping, torturing, and murdering his female assistant. And this was such a sensational case that it was reported throughout the country, even in New York City newspapers, for example. I think for quite a few Klan's people, that may have been kind of a last straw. But, you know, I think what's important to understand is that what we need to pay attention to in thinking about the continuity in American history is not how many people were actually members of this organization, but for how long this kind of intolerance and bigotry continued in one form or another, sometimes a little bit more underground, sometimes appearing strongly above ground. Just one example, we know that quite a few Klansmen from the 20s went into the neo-Nazi movements of the 1930s. People often forget that there was quite a neo-Nazi movement in the United States in the 30s, people who were openly praising Hitler and Mussolini. So another example of the Klan continuing in another form, one of the big kind of bigoted uh, radio personalities of the 1930s was a man called Charles Coughlin. I think of him as sort of the first shock jock. <laughs> right. And oddly enough, a Catholic, you know, which is kind of funny because he's... And he was a Catholic. Now, the second clan had been vehemently anti-Catholic, and yet many of them were quite willing to shed that particular prejudice and become avid supporters of Father Coughlin, as he was called. Mm. So you see another pattern here, which is that that kind of bigotry can be fungible. It can change its object, its target, while expressing the same kind of notion, which is often claimed about American history and claims that were entirely false. The claim is that America always had been a white Protestant country, and it was destined by God to be a white Protestant country. So they're constantly using these false histories as a way of justifying the politics of the Klan. Right. And also deeming anything that any kind of social change as a direct threat to the maintenance of that white Protestant order. And the next big threat that they see it, which sort of revives, I guess, the Klan 3.0, which is in the 1950s, particularly after the Brown versus Board of Education decision by the Supreme Court that called for desegregation. And suddenly there appear white citizens councils and other organizations that have a pretty substantial membership that are would identify themselves as Klan members. Right. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, you know, I'm really not an expert on what has gone on more recently, but one point I would like to make about what we see today, and that is that I do not think we should focus on the Klan as an organization. And when we're looking at the contemporary rise of white nationalism, the Klan is only a small minority of these groups. Right. So it might be a revival of the, maybe the fourth revival of the Klan, but it's, that's really a small part of a larger phenomenon. Exactly. And in many ways, I think there's some evidence that the Klan tends to attract somewhat older people. Whereas, you know, the white nationalists are in part alarming because they're young men who seem to be itching for a fight. They are not only filled with these expressions of bigotry, but they really would like to use force against the people that they see as their enemies. Still, you know, I would say about them, but and as well as about the second clan, that the use of force is really not the major problem. The major problem and the major achievement of the second clan was to legitimate open expressions of this kind of bigotry, to make it seem respectable to denounce Catholics, Jews, Greeks, Italians, black people, Mexican people. You you understand what I'm saying. It's a whole gamut of anyone who's not a white Protestant. And in a way, I think that this was their biggest victory. And I think what we see today is that to the extent that there are victories of these kind of movements, it is about making it again seem respectable to voice these kind of views. And there's all kinds of data to show that this is not just there are hate crimes and acts of violence. And there are all these things that are seem to be captured now on video and on social media of 
you know, what seemed to be a th- just thousands of little incidents, you know, arguments in parking lots, people saying things to people at stoplights, African-American men being arrested in Starbucks. It does seem to be just an emboldening of people's expressions of racism, such as we haven't seen in a long time. Yeah. Is there a final thing or final connection between the Klan of the 1920s and what we see in the white nationalist resurgence now? One thing that seems to me an important theme is this idea of victimhood and this notion that that it's their responsibility to take the country back. There's a lot of that kind of take back America rhetoric in the 1920s, and we certainly have seen a resurgence of that now. Yes. I would say there's a few themes that are consistent. One is instilling fear, closely related is what you've just said, taking up the position that makes them the victims. Another thing is the spread of fake news and conspiracy theories and the fact that these many, many groups and communities of people seem to have the power to make a lot of people believe accusations that are just inane and couldn't possibly be true or couldn't seem true to anyone who cares about evidence. Also, there is involved, I think, an anti-intellectualism, which goes along with the conspiracy theories because it is a kind of refusal to be swayed by evidence or refusal to ask for evidence for any of these outrageous claims. Yeah, and I think that that plays a big role in sort of the wild kind of public rhetoric that we see in the the kind of people that have incredible influence uh, right. in our society right now. So, well, we live in uh, fractious and scary times. And if ever there was a moment in American history where learning more about American history, you mentioned sort of false narratives of American history, this would certainly be a good one. So absolutely, there's a lot of work for historians like you and me and many, many others to do. And a book like this certainly goes a long way to reminding people of what really took place and, and what forms this kind of intolerance took way back when and how it's operated for a much longer period of time and really hasn't ever gone away. It's gone underground and and resurfaces in in moments like this. Absolutely. And I want to thank you for doing this. I think it's very valuable (laughs) what you're doing. And also personally, if I may say it, I could tell that you've really read the book, which makes a conversation with you really, really enjoyable. Well, thank you. And it's been great to talk to you. And it was a great book to read. And I certainly encourage my listeners to go out and get it because I think it's just an interesting chapter in history, but also one that's incredibly relevant to today. So Linda Gordon, thanks so much for taking the time to speak to us at In the Past Lane. Thanks. Take care. Linda Gordon is the author of The Second Coming of the KKK the Ku Klux Klan of the 1920s, and the American political tradition, published by LiveRight. If you're interested in learning more about the history of the United States in the 19-teens and 1920s, check out In the Past Lanes episode number three, where I talk to historian Lisa McGurr about her book on Prohibition, or episode 13, which is about the fascinating history of the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, people, that's all for this episode of In the Past Lane. Thank you so much for tuning in. For more information about the many things we talked about today, head over to our show page for this episode at inthepastlane.com. That's where you can find recommended readings, images, and links, plus details on the songs you've heard in this episode, courtesy of the Free Music Archive. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to this podcast at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, Spotify, or wherever you access your podcasts. And tell your friends about In the Past Lane. Maybe even give us a shout-out on social media. Those are two great ways to help us grow the In the Past Lane listening community. Thanks. Thanks also to some of the people who make this podcast possible, including executive producer Lulu Spencer and musician Jay Graham, who created and performed the intro music for this podcast. I'd love to hear from you people, so send me your comments, questions, and suggestions via Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, what's the biggest challenge when it comes to producing this podcast? Getting out of bed each morning. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) 